Today is Queen's Day in Amsterdam, and I have three containers of psilocybin containing truffles. I'm gonna start by taking eight grams of this 15 gram container because that's what the man at the smart shop advised me to do. And, uh, and then I suppose I'm going to go out and walk around on Queen's Day, which is incredibly chaotic and disgusting and uh, probably the worst possible place to take them. This is the first time I've ever consumed a psychedelic truffle. You can't really get these in the United States as far as I know. It's actually much less than I would eat of a mushroom. It doesn't seem like very much at all. Okay. Yesterday I arrived in Amsterdam, doubtlessly one of the sickest places on earth to get blazed on dank nugs. But my interest is not solely confined to blazing dank nugs. Amsterdam is fertile ground for all manner of psychoactive substance. I came here to find the Psilocybe Tampanensis Sclerotium, or Philosopher's Stone Truffle. It was not until the infamous mushroom ban of 2008 that the psychedelic sclerotium gained widespread popularity due to the fact that its effects and chemical composition are almost indistinguishable from the psilocybin mushroom. Mushrooms were once completely legal, and since the early 90s, the Netherlands led the world in the development of commercial psychedelic mushroom growing techniques. But everything changed in 2008 when the Dutch government banned psilocybin containing mushrooms, responding to a number of highly publicized deaths misguidedly blamed on the innocent fungus. Truffles escaped the ban unscathed and hold a place inside the hearts of all true Dutch. I am here to learn about how these strange protuberances are cultivated, and why they have not been banned. There are no better people to consult than the Truffle Brothers, two of the world's leading experts in the mass production of psychedelic sclerotia. I visited the brothers' farm in Hazerswaardedorp, formerly the second largest mushroom farm in the Netherlands. Having survived the mushroom ban, the Truffle Brothers now dominate the psilocybin-containing fungus industry. I sat down with Morad and Ali to discuss the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, first of all, my name is uh, Ali. Next to, my, uh, next to me is uh, sitting my brother, uh, Morad. We are, in fact, the, the known as the Truffle Brothers. <laughs> You're here at the farm of uh, magictruffles.com. Uh, we produce uh, Sclerotia, also known as Magic Truffles. And how did this company get started? Interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> Long story. <laughs> that started somewhere around 1993, 94, I guess. I learned mushroom growing in Belgium. Mushrooms for eating, normal white button mushrooms. That was my occupation before I started with these mushrooms. Uh, so I had quite a great network in that area, in that field. And one day a friend of mine comes up to me and says, look, what I, what I found, uh, he shows me uh, a Petri dish with spores. So, that's interesting, what kind of mushroom is it? He said, well, it's a magic mushroom. And I never heard of it. So I took a closer look. I went to a friend of mine who owned a laboratory, a, a mycological laboratory and asked him, can we do something with these pores? He said, well, let's give it a try. <laughs> and after two weeks, there was one mushroom in the aquarium, but it was a giant mushroom. It was about a, a big cubens this, this, this tall. <laughs> we were looking at it and said, okay, let's, uh, let's harvest the thing. <laughs> and you were operating a pizza restaurant beforehand, you said? <laughs> in that time, yes. The life cycle of a mushroom begins when two spores of opposite mating types germinate in a growth substrate and send out threads called hyphae. 
The hyphae form a clamp connection where genetic information is exchanged and then expand into a web of undifferentiated threads called mycelium. If the conditions are right, the mycelium organizes itself into a mushroom with special reproductive cells called basidia, which catapult spores into the air and give rise to new mushrooms. And you bought this property? But Not in the, in the first place. Uh, first of all, we, we, we were in We started uh, in, the, in my place, in, in the, the bedroom of my daughter, with several aquaria this time. After the, the one aquarium, <laughs> I started to, uh, to gather aquariums. Start searching on the street at night, and people were throwing out their old aquariums. <laughs> yeah, there's one, <laughs> let's take it. My daughter's room was filled with, uh, I think, about 12 aquaria or, or something. something. Like that. And we started to grow mushrooms in there. Then we rented our first place in a town called Leiderdorp, not far from here. We made some sheds out of plastic foil uh, with shelves in it, and uh, there we started our first professional growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right after that, we, we moved to a, a bigger place with 10 growing houses. But it wasn't enough. It was, the demand was so high that we couldn't uh, make enough mushrooms. And then we saw this, which was far more ideal. And what were you growing, what sorts of mushrooms were you growing before the mushroom ban? Uh, we had several species of uh, the Psilocybe cubensis and the Peniolus uh, cyanosens. And that was what you sold more than anything, more than the truffles you sold? Yeah, the truffles were s just uh, for the connoisseur, uh, for the, it was a side product in that time. To better understand the prohibition of the sacred mushroom, I go to meet criminal lawyer Karem Kanatan, who explained the nuances of Dutch drug law. Okay, well first of all we have what, like many countries, we have the class A drugs and class B drugs. So that's, that's not different from any other countries. So we have a list of drugs that are illegal. To buy it, to use it, to um, bring it over the border, etc. It's completely illegal. Then we have a small portion of drugs, in, in, in Holland we call it soft drugs, where you have the weed and the hashies and the joints, or we call it joints because that's, we, we smoke joints, I don't know if that's, uh, that's a correct, correct term, but um, we have which uh, is called a, like a tolerance policy by the Dutch government, and they have on paper saying that if the amount doesn't, uh, isn't bigger than this so and so, so much, um, then it's allowed to have it, it's allowed to smoke it, and, it's allowed, and you are allowed to sell it. So up until around 2007, it was okay to use the magic mushrooms. These were the salad days for mushrooms, but a series of unfortunate incidents where mentally ill tourists hurt themselves turned politicians against the sacred mushroom, and they began to legislate a ban. Het is het zoveelste incident waarbij toeristen na gebruik van paddo's de weg kwijt raken. Though there had been scattered mushroom incidents in Amsterdam for decades, it was not until the death of a 17-year-old French student named Gael Karoff that lawmakers began taking serious steps towards banning the sale and consumption of psychedelic mushrooms. Toen uh, is een meisje achter dat orgel gaan zitten, heeft daar een uh, stukje gespeeld, is naar buiten gerend, twee jongens er achteraan, en toen een kwartier later kwamen de jongens uh, terug, en uh, lijkt bleek uiteraard. Ma fille était une élève brillante à l'école, avec un avenir certain. Ma fille ne voulait pas mourir, j'en reste persuadée, c'est la drogue qui l'a tuée. After the incident with Gaël, others followed. A Frenchman, supposedly under the influence of mushrooms, ritualistically sacrificed his dog with a pair of kitchen shears in order to free the dog's mind from its corporeal shackles. De politie kreeg een melding van stadstoezicht, die de man besmeurd met bloed met zijn hond in het busje zag zitten. De man blijkt zijn hond met een mes en een schaar te hebben vermoord. He said, well, I was on, on mushrooms. He had a psychosis. And he had, it had nothing to do with mushrooms. He wasn't even close to mushrooms. Since these products are legal in this country, it's very easy to hide yourself behind it. With prohibition looming on the horizon, protesters swarmed the parliament building, armed with super soakers filled with psychedelic mushroom spores, which they used to spray the surrounding parks and lawns. They demanded their right to consume mushrooms, 
but Parliament ruled in favor of the ban. So in 2008, they banned all of these different uh, genus and species. Yeah, well, part of them were already already on, uh, on it, but especially this list from 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 here, uh, the uh, magic mushroom list, and it says here that magic mushrooms are mushrooms who have by nature uh, these and these uh, active uh, ingredients. And then all these species um, uh, are on the list. The law changed in 2008, 1st of December 2008. Sad day, the saddest day of my life. How much time did they give you after the ban to get rid of your stock of mushrooms? <laughs> 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> Ten days to clear, 16 growing houses, all the equipment, and so on. And you were saying all these other different bands have been given enormous amounts of time, years, before they have to... Ming, Ming farms, for instance, they got, uh, they got 10 years to, uh, to, to change the plans. 10 years? 10 years. Yeah. And you got 10 days? 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. How did you get rid of the mushrooms? That was the easiest part. Because <laughs> people were lined up here. <laughs> My, the last mushrooms, the last mushrooms. Despite the chemical and biological similarity to the mushroom, Parliament decided not to ban the magic truffle. When the law changed in 2008, we just continued with the truffles that we were already growing in that time. So what is a truffle and how is it different from a mushroom? Let's call it a parking lot for nutrients and moisture. Like all organisms, a fungus seeks to reproduce, but environmental conditions are not always ideal to do so. If the substrate is too dry, cold, hot, or poor in nutrients, the mycelium will grow inwards, forming a tangled clump of globular fungus called a sclerotium. These hard structures are able to survive in harsh environmental conditions until the time is right to send forth mushrooms. Murat offered to give me a guided tour of their innovative sclerotium cultivation facilities. Uh, we'll start uh, where it all begins. That's the, uh, the dirty side where all raw materials come in. First, the ryegrass seed substrate is sterilized in an industrial-sized autoclave to kill opportunistic bacteria and fungi, which are equally eager to consume the bags of warm, moist nutrients. Then the bags are inoculated with a liquid culture of mycelium. This is a class 100 clean room. That means that only 100 particles of zero point 00096 micron may be present in one cubic feet of air. Normally in an operating room it's class 10,000, so 10,000 particles may appear in a cubic foot of air. Impressive. If you do everything like your laboratory work and you're growing under one roof, you get a cross contamination somewhere, somehow, and that risk was so big that we looked for a, a, a proper building with at least two separate departments. Then the bags are transported to an incubation chamber where a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius is maintained to accelerate the colonization of the substrate. How do you prevent the growth of mushrooms? By controlling the temperature and the yeah. microclimate in the bag. Uh, the microclimate in the bag is not suitable for fortification, for, for formation of mushrooms. The final stage is the nursery, where the bags are kept in darkness for as many as five months before the sclerotia are mature. And what is the capacity of this plant at the moment? <laughs> the full capacity, uh, if we would work 24 hours a day in three shifts, 18,000 tons per year. Something like that, yeah. 18,000 tons. Yes. Yeah. I think that sclerotia took over the mushroom market one on one yeah. By now. By now it's one-on-one, uh, -on -one, yeah. Upon maturity, the bags are opened, the sclerotia are plucked from their substrate, cleaned with a soft bristled brush, and packaged for distribution. It seems your brand is the only brand, except for one other that I saw, that you can get at smart shops in Amsterdam. Yeah, that might be correct. There are some home growers, but as far as commercially grown sclerotia, I think we're the largest. Do you have any competitors? <clears throat> Everyone who grows a, a truffle is, is a competitor. Ah. <laughs>
Each package contains a single serving of fresh psilocybin-containing sclerotia. We delivered them to the shop in boxes of 24. We give the shops 24 booklets so that people get the proper information. Good. Murat invited me to join him on his delivery route and visit the Magic Truffle storefront in Amsterdam. The Dutch countryside touched us both deeply, but we could not linger on these natural delights. We had important sclerotium deliveries to make. One of the stops was a wholesale psychedelics distributor specializing in peyote cacti. We finally made it to the shop, and not a minute too soon, as the hordes of truffle-hungry Dutch waited eagerly for their Queen's Day delights. Chills and Thrills was not the truffle theme park I was expecting, but I knew the real ride would come later. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I would like to buy some P. tamponensis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. The truffles require no preparation, and though the Truffle Brothers recommended a truffle-based milkshake, I chose to take them raw so that I could savor their essences. It's not bad at all. It's actually kind of good. Well, it has almost a sour aftertaste, but sour is like, sour is the last taste I would associate uh, with a truffle. <laughs> Do you want some truffle crumbs? <laughs> Scarf them down. It tastes pretty darn uh, like a wet nut. This is a drug. <laughs> this is a drug. <laughs> Technically a drug. But... Um, well, I don't have any experience with the truffles, um, but if it's not a health risk and it doesn't have any other uh, negative side effects, I would say allow it and then make sure you can control it. What sort of person buys psychedelic truffles? I don't think there's a specific type of person. Age has nothing to do with it. We've had people in their 80s coming for mushrooms. Yeah, or people who are curious for the, for the experience, who, who think there's more in life than uh, the regular things we see. And there are also the, the, the real cosmonauts who use it for the, the real spiritual thing, like the shamanic experiences. What category would you put yourselves into? None. None? You don't use your own product? No. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> While the Mazatec Indians prescribed special conditions under which the sacred mushroom should be consumed. There exists little known ritual surrounding the psychedelic sclerotium. Their history remains unwritten. Though I feel sweaty and overwhelmed by the chaos of Queen's Day, I feel no compulsion to ritualistically stab a dog and play with its internal organs in a van, nor do I wish to jump off a bridge to a watery death. I'm glad that the resilient structure of the sclerotium has survived the inhospitable environment of prohibition, and I hope that it sends forth mycelial threads of liberty. 
for many years to come.